All right, I think it is time to get started. Thanks everybody for coming. My name is David Moltz. I get the privilege of uh, introducing the two founders of Ninkazi Brewery. We have Jamie and Nico, so thank you guys for joining us today. Thanks for having us. So, yeah, let's do a round of applause. <laughs> To kick it off, everybody look under your seat. There are five golden coins that have been shot up to space and back, and you might be the lucky recipient. If it's not under yours, please do not go through all the other seats right now. We can do that later. <laughs> it is physically attached, taped to the underneath. Hopefully there's... They were used as uh, ballast for the rocket, so we made commemorative coins to use instead of just straight weight. Has anyone found one? <laughs> or it was an April Fool's Yeah, we're just, see, you're checking to see if there's gum under any of those seats for, the, for Google, so we appreciate keeping it tidy. Great. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. We also have trivia at the very end of this, so pay attention through the talk, because there might be some prizes coming later. So, all right, let's, uh, let's start us out. Um, Ninkasi Brewery, what, what does Ninkasi mean? So Ninkasi was the ancient Sumerian goddess of fermentation. So Sumerians were the first culture we know of that brewed beer, and they worshipped different god gods and goddesses, and Ninkasi was the goddess they worshipped for what at the time they believed was the miraculous process of fermentation. And if you want to go really deep into it, it's even speculated that beer and fermentation were part of the reason that they settled into a sort of more stable agrarian society, so a foundational element uh, in beer. Yeah, just to add to that, the oldest living recipe in human existence is the prayer of Ninkasi, which is an explanation of uh, just not just a praise of her, but an explanation of how beer was made. Um, and it's an important aspect that we like to point out is that beer is food. Um, we're kind of lucky as civilization not to have to uh, count on that all the time. And so a lot of times people chuckle at that. But um, beer originally served as a way to... Uh, unleash nutrients from grains that were not understood better at the time as far as, you know, uh, how to get, you know, nutrients out of cereal grains and um, also made for potable water, which is why we didn't have to hunt and gather anymore. Very cool. <clears throat> and uh, expanding on that, can you give us a background of your brewery, how it came to be, how you two met, etc.? Sure. I'll, <clears throat> I'll start just real quick to give some background because I'm the founding brewer part of the um, situation that um, I started brewing when I was 17 years old as a college student, and it was one of the nerdy uh, sort of uh, side projects I did um, and hobbies. And uh, uh, when I graduated from college, I had a sociology degree, and I got a uh, job pretty much right afterwards as a kitchen manager of a brew pub in Eugene called Steelhead, and uh, was just paying some college bills and sort of sorting myself out uh, when about a year later I got asked to be uh, an assistant brewer at Steelhead. And that's when I realized uh, that my dream of uh, being an educator, opening my own business, um, and uh, supporting our community could come real through making beer. And I spent 11 years at Steelhead uh, building the skill sets that I needed to start uh, Ninkasi, at which point um, I, I took the leap and decided to leave. And uh, Nikos and I were actually acquaintances through a mutual friend um, who works with us and, and does a lot of uh, all the amazing uh, tap handles and metal artwork we do um, is inspired by him. And uh, uh, basically, Nikos actually applied to be my assistant brewer when he moved back to Eugene. And um, Not hired. Not hired. I was quitting, and uh, I didn't really actually want to hire the people that uh, were going to replace it because they were hoping to work with me, and I knew I was quitting. But uh, put that little seed in the back of the head, and one fateful day after work, we were all at the Beer Stein, a local bottle store in Eugene. and. Um, uh, Nikos and our friend Jazz asked me what I'd do if I ever started a brewery and I sort of ranted on at a time which I wasn't telling anybody because uh, I, I, I would have been fired from my company right away and all that stuff. But uh, kind of started that inspiration and spark started there and, and Nikos and I got together and, and started working on the project uh, and we opened doors in 2006. Um, uh, uh, July 1st of 2006 is what we count as our birthday and uh, have done quite a bit in, in, in nine years almost here. Very cool. And what was the first beer you guys brewed? First beer we made was Total Domination IPA, from you're drinking right now. Um, so it was at a time when uh, it wasn't as common to have IPAs everywhere uh, like we have today. It's definitely caught 
caught on as the top beer style in the craft industry. But at that time, there were very few that were commercially available um, from packaging breweries. And so uh, it's been a beer style that Jamie had been making for a long time at Steelhead, and it was the first beer that we wanted to make as new coffee. Yeah, I, and I, IPA was the second style of beer I ever made. Uh, I made a stout first with my long-term home brewing friend, Russ, and then started IPAs as well. So, um, you know, IPAs uh, have been coming out of the Pacific Northwest since the early 90s, just like San Diego. Very cool. And so you guys are based in Eugene. Um, you <coughs> distribute all over Oregon. Um, we see you here in California. Can you talk about your distribution? Like, What's your biggest market? You know, where did you start and go from there? Sure. Um, we started just in Eugene, and we self-distributed our products there. We still self-distribute our products there. And then we just sort of expanded out concentrically, more or less. Um, and uh, still, Oregon and the Pacific Northwest are our biggest markets. Um, in Oregon now, Portland as a single market is our biggest single market. Um, but definitely now, spreading into some new territories, uh, we're excited for the opportunities that we have like in California. and. Um, now Arizona, Nevada, Utah, um, Idaho, Colorado, Colorado, Alaska, Alaska, British Columbia. So yeah, and we're spreading out. Yep. Very cool. And according to um, Rate Beer, there's almost 200 breweries and brew pubs in Oregon. So how do you compete with so many, you know, breweries around you? You know, a lot of the craft beer movement changed uh, shortly after we started, and we're, we're not trying to take credit for all that change, although we. Uh, made some decisions early on that certainly helped uh, a lot of other breweries sort of get into the market in a different way as far as uh, taking some risks with some distribution and really supporting some folks that were trying to come up themselves in, in that uh, range. Um, but, you know, a lot of it for us is we did get kind of out in front um, kind of early on. I'd also started brewing, you know, at a really young age and we got into the business in 1995, which was still relatively young at that point. Um, Steelhead was the number 10 brewery in the state of Oregon, um, you know, and as you say now, just nine years, well, excuse me, more like 15 years later, um, there's almost 200. So we got in front of that a little bit. Um, because of that as well, you know, we, we were able to get a good chunk of, uh, you know, market share up front and really it provided opportunities for other breweries to get in and compete against us, which has always been fine with us. And I also started as part of getting the skill sets needed to open my own brewery. I started early on serving as a board member of the Oregon Brewers Guild and really spent a lot of time networking with everybody in the industry as, as much as I possibly could. So I was the first president of the Oregon Brewers Guild that wasn't an owner of a brewery um, and sort of was looked at as kind of one of those up and coming, you know, uh, young leaders and represented sort of the small brewery. Um, it's changed a little bit, obviously, with us being the third largest, uh, you know, as far as sales for Oregonians, uh, brewers uh, in, in, in uh, Oregon. Uh, but we still lead with that leadership, and I spend a lot of time in the home brewing community. And so people know us to be real and authentic, which is an important part of who we are, and I think that that really helps the cause. I mean, there's still going to be some haters out there in the world, and, um, you know, whether it's jealousy or just not knowing us or whatever it is, you know, we just keep plugging along and be friendly and um, uh, and a lot of the principles that we do, um, we work a lot with the Brewers Association and other trades to really help support um, other breweries as they come up. I spend time on the uh, uh, Brewers Association uh, Technical Committee and um, helping create the Quality Subcommittee uh, because with now, um, you know, upwards of 3,700 breweries and when we started, I think, what was there, 1,100 maybe? 1,600 I think. 1,600 when we started. So 2,000 breweries have started in the last uh, nine years. So there's going to be quite a difference in level of quality out there. And those of us that have been in the industry don't want to see uh, other breweries have to make some of the mistakes that some people have made as they grew. And, and we're really concerned about the total, total flavor profile. I, I think it's uh, definitely a branch of craft that's different than the old sort of school of brewing of fierce competitiveness and hatred of each other. You know, you don't hear as many people who worked at Budweiser for 20 years jump over to Miller as you see breweries within the craft community jump around and stuff. Yeah, it's still a really collaborative industry, which is a great thing. It makes yeah. it a lot of fun. Lots of collaboration. Absolutely. <laughs> and so we're actually here today to talk about their new beer. So we will open with a video. Mark, T minus 30 seconds. The vehicle is armed. Three, two, one.
We're going to dust it out first. The culture when we rock it and we put it in your face. We put a culture in a rocket and we shot it in his face. We put a culture in a bottle and you love the way it tastes. That's why we put a culture in a rocket. We decided to send yeast into space and create a space beer, the first ever, um, and you called it ground control. So can you talk about how you got the, I the crazy idea to do that? Yeah, uh, you know, um, I had a, about two years ago the, the really wonderful uh, sort of happenstance of a mutual friend uh, uh, and someone who works with our wholesale uh, distributorship up in Portland um, who knows some of the... Uh, uh, amateur rocket enthusiasts that we worked with on the first mission and um, at an event I was doing um, uh, Chip who was a part of Team Hyperdyne came and brought his computer and sat down with me and started to show me you know past rocket missions part of what was going on explain the program and um, I, I, I grew up with a very serious determination to be an astronaut and not sort of just in the boys like I want to be an astronaut sort of stance I was really prepared to join the Navy and be a uh, officer and become a pilot and go through the whole program and you know uh, say I'd be willing to strap to a rocket and get launched into space and see what happened and um, obviously I chose a different lifestyle and course uh, but um, I'm still a nerd uh, most people that know me know that you know my love of Star Wars and sci-fi and space and astronomy in general um, so I, I was obviously really intrigued um, John, who was there, said it was the first time he's been, and still to this day, that I've been to an event in which I was kind of blowing everybody else off at the event because uh, I was just too focused on the nerdydom at, at hand. Um, about six months later, they reapproached us. Uh, they were looking, you know, obviously for support for an amateur launch where it didn't have government support. Um, thankfully, Nikos is as nerdy as I am and uh, loves the creative spirit of uh, frontiership and sort of who we are as humans. and. Um, we, we, you know, we, we, we kind of got involved. Um, uh, we, we support lots of awesome things and, and don't necessarily participate in a deeper way, but we sort of like, well, if we're going to do this, let's, let's do something. And, and what we decided to do so that really, in the end, we could be closer to the whole process was, you know, let's try to send yeast to space and create the environment and the uh, controls that are there so that we can defy the gravitational challenges and the extreme g-forces of leaving uh, Earth's atmosphere, the extreme cold of space, the solar radiation that's emitted um, outside of our atmosphere that we're protected from, and then of course the intense heat of return. Um, and that took a lot of work, and uh, obviously two tries, and, um, uh, and that's kind of the approach that we took. So um, it just sort of came together. It was the right rhythm and feel, and you know, it, it kind of comes down to when Chip asked our friend John, you know, hey, we, we thought about talking to a brewery, what would you do? And he said, oh, there's only one brewery that I could think of that could possibly want to do this. And maybe that's an stretch in terms, I'm sure there's some other people that wish they could do it, but, uh, you know, we recognize the opportunity to be a, bar, a part of something that was way outside of our general sphere and something as exciting as what turned out. So it's been really awesome. Very cool. Yeah, I was, I was reading on, online and a lot of people are super excited. It's a crazy, you know, new, you know, brand new idea. But then there were some skeptics that were kind of questioning, like, is there really a benefit to doing this, you know, or is it a way to sell more beer? So how do you, how do you respond, you know, when people ask these sort of questions? <laughs> there's probably, there's really no good reason to do, to do what we did. So I guess I would be like, I agree, yeah. But it was, it was, uh, it was a really fun and exciting adventure, for sure. It was a lot harder than uh, I thought it was going to be when we first were like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's make it happen. Um, and it took a lot, and yeah, two missions, and a lot of involvement, and a lot uh, of energy, but it was really, really cool to learn about what was going on, kind of be in 
sort of a fringe area of science like that. I mean, rocketry, especially at the amateur level or the sort of non-governmental level, is, uh, you know, it's really hard and it's something that is really cool to see people that they're so into it that they um, can actually make it happen. And uh, watching something launch into space is also a lot more visceral than um, you might think if you haven't seen it happen. I thought it would be cool to see, but actually being there for it was uh, really, really awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I like to use the example of, uh, um, you know, most people are turn on the TV at night and probably at least one out of the five TV shows they really like is based on a spaceship where people are cruising around and being and beaming themselves everywhere and just having normal conversations. Let's go to the mess hall and hang out and stuff. And, and really, this process really brought it home. I mean, you can really, you know, in, empirically we know that that's not the case, but the reality is, is we're way behind the gun of anything close to that. And every space mission is fraught with the potential of failure and everything about it is con contingent upon you know calculating everything precisely and making sure that nothing went wrong and making sure the weather is right and making sure there isn't a satellite in the way and just all kinds of amazing stuff and so you know it was really meaningful for us to be a part of something where you know we could see the the real intensity um of 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 what it takes to put something into space it's it's definitely for me it's a it's 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 a lifetime you know sort of value for me just to experience watching it. I mean, it really does. If you watch a, you know, people watch fireworks and all that, but there is something just primordial, which sounds weird, but it just takes you all the way to the sort of soul level when you watch just how crazy we are that we decided at some point we would try to just like bail gravity. You know, it's you know it was pretty kind of you know put us back for a while when we first realized what gravity was. We were like, well, I guess that's it. But, you know, with airplanes and then other things now, we're crazy enough as a, as a human populace to just really take that exploration further. Very cool. And so why did you decide to make an Imperial Stout um, versus other styles you could have made with that yeast? And then how did you decide on the name Ground Control? Um, you know, as far as the, the beer goes, we really wanted to create, this is a really special project, and we really wanted to create something to, you know, back it all the way up. Uh, and so we wanted to make a beer that would, you know, with, with the artwork and with the story, it's surely going to be a collectible item. Uh, and uh, so it is going to get put into cellars. So we didn't want to brew like a blonde ale or, you know, like American Standard Light Lager or something that would be um, not that drinkable in four months later. Um, so we wanted to brew a beer that was like that. Um, we've made a number of Imperial Stouts and we wanted to make something that was unique to itself. I mean, you can make a lot of different Stouts and a lot of different IPAs. Um, so we sourced some local hazelnuts that were grown in Oregon. Uh, we got some cocoa nibs from a chocolate uh, creator in Seattle, um, and then star anise that we were able to uh, uh, get locally from an herb wildcrafter that was there. So we decided to create sort of a dessert-oriented uh, uh, imperial stout that would sell her well and um, you know sort of be worth the total value and price of the excitement of the rest of the uh, experience. And of course, uh, we used. Uh, Apollo and Comet and, um, and uh, Bravo and Bravo hops in it, and uh, you know we kind of we tied as much of it as we could together into a beer that we thought. And of course, you know, space is pretty dark. It's uh, it's black and dark and heavy so. in a really light way. Yeah. And the name uh, Ground Control obviously it relates to space and relates to launching rockets and all that. And we had a lot of different names, and it's actually kind of the way you have to name beers these days in the craft beer industry because really with you know 3,000 plus 3,500 breweries um, there's a lot of names that are already in use out there so you kind of make a list of names that you'd like to to use and then you kind of go through that list and narrow it down and then you look and see which ones have or have not been used and go from there so um, we were we were happy that we were able to find something that we could relate to the process of launching and very cool the beer. Yeah, we also we also have a huge tie to music as far as our brewing culture goes. We have a recording studio inside our brewery, and actually work with a lot of bands and and, and do a lot of music. So the, obviously the Major Tom sort of ground control um, reference too is part of it as well. So it has that old sort of '70s retro feel to it, which I think really goes in line with the space program as a whole. Great. And so a lot of people in the room are wondering where they can pick it up. Are you distributing to local, like Bevmo, Whole Foods? What's kind of your distribution looking like? So it's pretty limited in its production, but it will be available throughout our territory. Um, and not exactly sure yet, every location, so it won't be broadly distributed, but a lot of specialty bottle shops and specialty beer retailers 
we'll be getting it through our network. So um, I would say check those out and call around and, uh, and see where it's at, or you can call the brewery, or you can check on yeah. our beer finder on the website and see where it's been delivered to. Yeah, either the, through the beer finder, or if you contact us, then we can you know, uh, put you in touch with our team down here, and uh, they can sort of share that with you. So we do, we do think that, given its limited supply, that it could go away pretty quickly, so definitely want to search it out. Nice. And speaking of that, are you planning on making more, um, doing this again, and making you know another style of beer with, with the yeast, or just a one and one time thing? Well, what we were able to the first time we sent up 16 test tubes of yeast, and uh, um, you know it took 27 days to find the rocket, and we had built uh, the conditions to keep the yeast alive for about 12 hours. They had two tracking devices that failed, so it took you know a long time. And at that 12th hour, it was actually 108 degrees out um, at the Black Rock Desert. Um, so we knew that the yeast was not going to be totally survived, and it came back, you know, there were some cells that were alive, but not enough to rejuvenate, and we learned a lot from the process. The second time we sent six different, uh, six uh, test tubes of yeast up, it had um, three different yeast strains involved, and we were able to get four test tubes back that were viable with three different yeast strains. So we used our house ale strain to create ground control. Um, we have a lager strain that we use for the Lux. Um, th those of you that had Lux, we sent that yeast to space and back. Um, and then we have an alt strain that we use in Slayer and some of the other beers. So we, we have the potential to culture up and continue to do this a, a little bit here and there. Um, and then one of the other things that we plan to do down the road is to, to release the yeast to uh, you know, some of the yeast banks that are out there that want to be able to maybe get it, get it out into the hands of home brewers and other stuff. We're not trying to be the proprietary owner too long over the whole deal. Of course, we want to do our run with it. but. Uh, we even have one of our, um, uh, we're actually really good friends with the, with the crew at Falling Sky Brewery, which is a much smaller brewery, but they, have, they make all their own foods and stuff there, and their baker, who I used to cook with a million years ago, requested to see if he could get the yeast to do a sourdough starter even. So, um, we're, we're, like we said earlier, we're a sharing community, so, um, you know, we want to, you know, it's, it's about sharing the yeast, but it's also about inspiring the imagination, so that just the creativity and brewing. I mean, there is a similarity kind of with that fringiness you're talking about between the extreme passion of a brewer, uh, of a home brewer, versus uh, you know, someone who's an amateur rocket uh, enthusiast. The only difference is the amateur rocket enthusiast gets to watch it go down about once every two years versus every weekend or when you have time, so. Right. And uh, going through this whole process, what sort of lessons have you learned on, on doing such an expedition? Like, you know, rather than just brewing, brewing a beer and distributing, you know, doing this whole, you know, kind of phased approach of, uh, you know, a major initiative, a marketing strategy, et cetera. I'd say, yeah, I think tying to Jamie's point of you kind of see things out there that uh, make you think that, oh, yeah, we've been to space forever. It's easy. It's something, you know, we're going to set out and do it. And I think that's kind of, you know, normally the experience that you have, at least that I've had generally in my day to day life, kind of do things that are kind of tried and true. And yeah, we started a brewery, but you know, there's a mechanism for that and there's distribution and there's a pathway to success there and, um, to make that happen. So getting involved with something that was not so cut and dry and then actually failing the first time around, because I mean, honestly, I went into it thinking like, oh, well, these guys know what they're doing. We'll get the yeast in there. We'll get it up there. We'll get it back. We'll make the beer nice and clean. And then it was like definitely this roller coaster through the whole thing of being involved and doing all these uh, activities with the teams to make it happen and then not having it work out and then trying to figure out what to do next. So I guess the lesson for me was more in the idea that there's still a lot of really cool things going on out there that we're not able to just do whenever we want to do them. And so that's a good, a good lesson to keep in mind. You've got to keep kind of pushing the envelope and taking things out to the edge. And, a different place to be when you're there. Right. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that I learned is that you have to, even if you think you know uh, your supply for something that you have to check ahead of time, we, uh, um, uh, the second launch happened uh, at Spaceport in New Mexico. Uh, we were staying in uh, Truth or Consequences, which is a funny name. I don't know why it's not Truth and Consequences, but it's still a really cool spot. And um, uh, we needed to use dry ice to pack around uh, the test tubes so that when it was re-entering that that intense heat could be on the outside and protect the yeast. Um, <clears throat> first, the, the, the second launch, the first day that the launch was supposed to happen, the weather was bad, so they postponed it, like you hear a lot on television, you know, it, you know they're not going to send a rocket up into a lightning storm, uh, which is good. Um, 
but we had to come back a few days later and James, who's in our marketing team, came back with me. He was a part of the first launch uh, site and was willing to come with me. And we checked into our hotel, we were gonna go eat some food and then you know, um, uh, go get the last supplies that we needed uh, at the Walmart that was there in town. And uh, in the three days that we weren't there, because we had been there and checked the dry ice supply, hunting season started and a group of hunters came in and bought all of the dry ice that was there. All of it, <laughs> not a single drop. And this is, we discovered that at 10.30 at night and we were supposed to meet the Rocketeers at three in the morning um, to be able to load our part of the rocket before NASA and some of the other scientists showed up. And uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it just shows uh, the ingenuity that it takes and the sort of struggle that goes on with all of this stuff and that we, we basically call, I think we made 40 phone calls uh, we realized that most of the Walmarts around that area did not have dry ice anymore. Um, the Roths chain, or Smith's chain, excuse me, had it, but they closed at 11. We were 10.30 at night, and we were at least 45 minutes from the closest one. Um, so things got kind of crazy, and we put a lot of time and resources. And so like, I basically went back to Walmart, just my typical, I don't fail, I'm not going to fail. It was trying to look for chemical cold packs or anything that probably still wouldn't work, but just anything for me not to feel like a total loser. And, the general manager was like, oh, there's a new yeast, uh, I mean, there's a new Walmart over in, in um, Alamos Gordo, uh, which is uh, 165 miles away from where we were. Um, so James and I popped into the convertible Camaro that we had rented for our Thelma and Louise moment together and uh, took off into the desert at midnight to drive all the way around White Sands Missile Range to get to the Texas border, basically, to buy dry ice and get back and we were able to move our, 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 our stuffing time to 4 a.m. Um, but that included two border patrols in which I had to like tell you know, border police that you know, we had dry ice in the trunk because we were trying to pack a rocket that was being launched into space. And what was so awesome about it is that they believed us because they worked next to the White, Miss, you know, White Sands Missile Range where rockets happened. So it was like, yeah, you, you, you learn that you know, that is part of the human spirit that we don't quit and we don't you know, we, we just look for options, and I'm really glad James was there. That had been a real tough gig by myself or for anybody to do by themselves. But, you know, through, through that creative spirit and just not giving up, you can achieve a lot. And, you know, it, it really does equate to a deeper satisfaction to it. So when people ask us how much the mission costs and does it have a payback and all of that stuff, I mean, I have a lifetime of total memories and, and satisfaction from uh, being a part of it. And really getting to know these people who's dedicated their entire lives to this and don't get to share this with many people more than once. I mean, you know, they have different clients that come in and out and they might know some colleagues and stuff, but they're kind of out there in the fringe. And it's wonderful to see people that just love what they do as much as we love what we do. And, I, I, you know, I think that that's a really heavy lesson for me is we all do what we love. And, you know, especially if we're lucky. And um, to the degree that we can share those experiences with each other, we can really bolster each other up. And, and help us see new perspectives and you know it's an experience that I'll never forget. And I don't know what it is about rocket launches but so that's the second time we stayed up all night before a rocket yeah. launch. The first time we actually were driving around in the Black Rock Desert. If you've been out there you can just basically drive and drive and you know, where the Burning Man project happened. Because it's totally flat and we ended up getting lost and then ended up having to also be at, at the rocket launch at 4 a.m. so we ended up just staying up all night. And, uh, waiting for the launch, so. Yeah, it was two, day, it two yeah. days after the supermoon, so it was yeah. a pretty amazing night on the playa. We were, we were doing a little roof surfing when we got lost, so it was a good night, though. Very cool. So we have a few more questions uh, by request, and then we're gonna open up to Q&A. So um, one of the first questions was um, canning. So um, traditionally, you know, it's been a lot of like macro brews that have canned beers, and it's been associated with cheaper beers. And now there's a movement that a lot of the craft breweries are starting to can their beers. It's lighter, it doesn't allow as much light in. Can you talk about that? Um, is that something you guys would consider? Or Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely something we'd consider uh, for us at our scale and with our um, sort of focus on quality. It's just a pretty big investment to move into a whole new packaging line. Um, and we just actually built a new brewery. so. Uh, we're sort of working to get that filled up first, but it's not, it's not off the table. It's probably not something that's going to happen in the next few years, but it's definitely a direction that the industry is moving and there's a lot of great beer out there in cans now. So. Yeah, we, you know, living in Oregon, we, there's a lot of outdoor pursuits, not that there isn't in, you know, in California or whatnot, but, uh, you know, so, you know, all, most of us are hikers or kayakers or, you know, outdoor pursuits. Uh, 
So you know the, the can has that you know benefit to it, but our bottling line is capable of doing uh, a lot more than um, our annual production will reach for a long time, and so we're, we're rather focusing to upgrade and, and make that system better than to add a new one. We when we started, you know we had to use a mobile bottler, and then we bought a, a small similar machine, and then we had to use the mobile bottler in ourselves to keep up, and you know the the variance in quality just doesn't meet the standards that we're at now. And so for a lot of people that are starting out, they may be using mobile canning devices or people come in and can it for them, um, or buying smaller machines and stuff like that. And we've just really reached that level um, where we task ourselves too hard to want to put ourselves back. Why would we sell a canned beer that isn't going to have the same shelf life as a bottled beer of our own? But you know, to Nikos' point, it's, it's definitely not off the shelf. It's just sometimes Nikos and I are a lot more patient than our fans want us to be about some of the things. <laughs> Right, and uh, so you mentioned you know total, total dominations and IPA. You mentioned all the IPAs that are nowadays. Um, it seems like that's been the recent trend. IPAs. Do you see that you know staying here for a while, or do, what do you think is like the next big trend in, in craft beer? I think so. I mean, IPAs are delicious, and I still drink more IPA myself or IPA style beers than anything else. But I I view our brewery sort of as a microcosm possibly a future beer drinking trends because we kind of as brewers drink in dog years so one year to brewery is like seven years of regular drinking drinking out there just in terms <laughs> of volumetric probably so um start to see a lot of people insertly starting to move into some of the lager beers and lighter beers that we're making now just as a nice sort of easy drinking sessionable uh kind of classic beer and if you look to kind of his uh developed brewing regions in Europe and things like that. I mean, it's kind of historically gravitated also in the lager direction. So I'm guessing that IPAs will always be there to stay, and then there's going to be some other beers that also start to sort of take up another portion of the drinking experience for people. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, and we're, we're really fortunate in Oregon. You know, 50% of the beer that's consumed in Oregon is craft brewed, and 40% of that, or excuse me, 40% on draft. Um, that's you know specifically in the Portland and Eugene areas for the most part, which still make up over two thirds of the population. So it's a pretty amazing achievement for a small state, and that's really where the world is going. And 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 to Nikos's point, you know we sort of you know we live it. It's kind of a natural part. It's not hard for us to find. It's everywhere. And you know a six pack of Lux or a light a lighter lager is just as happy next to an IPA six pack when you're heading to a barbecue. Um, I think people are less specific. Yes, I'm a total hop head. I've been, I've, you know, been using hops my whole life. I love it. But I also uh, fell in love with brewing because of imports like German lagers, and it's always been an important part of who I am. And I think as as other demographics, people, uh, you know, ex-military people who have spent time in Europe uh, in their formative years serving in the military, they all discover beer. Their love of beer is, you know, centered around things like Bavarian beers and and other styles of beers than we're familiar with as you know young beer drinkers in, in the US and so as those demographics open up we're creating products that please them so it's not about trying to get the the vet who wishes they could drink a Hellas to love IPA it's about making them a Hellas you know and um, you know uh, I heard some other things about whether you know is sour beer one of the next things you know yes in the terms of that it's a trend but does it have long-term marketability is it something that you know you can't you know ask yourself do you think about drinking a gallon of vinegar every time you sit down to drink I mean it does similar things to your body um, so again it's it's a compliment you know someday we'll, we'll, we'll start doing some sour beers we're looking at doing a Berliner Weiss style beer which is a lot easier to do um, but we're really patient so we're, we're not as attached to that end price and I'm not sure that people that you know unless you have a smart business plan that people that focus on more esoteric styles as their core brand, they'll have to see how you know beneficial it is. There's been a, a definite resurgence of creativity in terms of the ingredients used in beers, and so a lot of cool stuff being thrown in beer that maybe people didn't think about, and I think that that really comes to the authenticity piece. So if, if, if the consumer thinks that it's a great idea for real and not just something cheesy and marketable, um, then that's you know where trends can start and stuff like that. But um, I think that that's that's the real deal. Um, the future trends of beer are going to be more about the beer itself and what and and what goes behind it and the breweries that do it than the specific beer or you know gimmick that might be there for some other breweries as well. 
Great, and then last question for me is, um, so you mentioned 2,000 new breweries have opened up over the years, and there's almost 500 in California. Do you think the, you know, the beer market is saturated? Do you think it's a bubble? Um, you know, just more and more keep opening up. Yeah, I don't think it's uh, saturated, for sure. I mean, the craft consumption in the United States is still under 20% of total beer consumed. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I think like any bubble, uh, scenario. There might be a lot. There might be people getting into the industry right now that maybe think it easy, think it's easier than it is um, because it has been a growing industry, or maybe coming into it for different reasons than you know wanting to make great beer and kind of put in the all the work that it takes to get to that point. So I think we'll definitely get to a point where some of that will kind of work itself out of the system. And I know you guys have probably never seen anything like that in tech, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think I think there's a lot of room for a lot more beer to be made in the United States as people start and continue to move into drinking craft. Yeah, I had a uh, uh, technical committee meeting earlier th uh, this week for the Brewers Association, and uh, w one of the members of the Brewers Association said that there's 900, I think, 56 breweries in planning currently in the United States. So we're about to go 25 percent more than we currently are. So. The, the reality of it is it's like a restaurant or anything else, you know, restaurants have a one in three chance of survival. I think, you know, depending on what your goals are, breweries have a good chance of survival. Um, but if, if you're a home brewer that doesn't you really have a lot of experience in um, owning a restaurant or selling alcohol or knowing the industry, um, and your goal is to see your beer on a Safeway shelf, it's going to be a tough ride because there's a, a lot of obstacles in the way of that goal uh, based on what your experience or maybe your resources are. But, you know, say you're a home brewer that's worked in a restaurant, your family owned a restaurant, and you want to open a little local brew pub um, that allows for, um, you know, your neighborhood to come and really support you, and most of your beer is sold on site, so you're not behoven to wholesale or distribution chains, chain acquisitions or large stores. Um, it just all depends. Some people are prepared for one style and one for another. The craft beer industry is huge. Um, James and, and our marketing department that I mentioned before said one of my favorite things, which is that um, be craft beer is one of the last punk rock movements left in the United States. And I think a lot of that has to do with the amount of government uh, regulation that we have, that there's a certain aspect of who we are that has to be a very specific way. But outside of that, we're really open sort of in, in a way that a original American spirit of you know, entrepreneurship or capitalism, whatever you want, in which people get to be themselves and really create business plans that are marketed towards their passions and, and drives. And I think that that, you know, the, the more that, that people um, resonate with the stories and the, and the qualities of the beers that are made, then the more that that story keeps perpetuating itself. So there's, there's going to be a continuance, and I don't think it's much to the chagrin of some of the larger breweries in the world. I, it's not going to go back that way. Um, those macro breweries had prohibition on their side, in which there were you know, uh, I think 20 years, 15 years before Prohibition, there were 3,000 breweries in the United States. Um, right before Prohibition, it had been reduced to 1,000 through uh, what we see these days of conglomerations and, and, and people uh, buying each other out. Um, but when it came back, uh, a lot of breweries flourished and a dramatic few uh, rabbled, you know, wrangled them all up and created a pretty small amount and, and you know, basically created the culture that Drinking beer in the U.S. means one thing, and it's our beer. And the differences between our branding and the subtle differences in the ingredients we use is, is the difference between beer. And, you know, we're just a different culture now. Millennials don't care what their parents drink, and that's just the reality. You know, I know what my, you know, my dad spent seven years in the Air Force, uh, uh, almost six of it in Alaska. He drank a lot of Rainier and played a lot of cards. And he back then smoked cigarettes, you know, and I, and that, I think of that. My uncle drank Coors when he made steaks in the backyard. And, and I have resonance with that as a kid, but I also own a brewery. So of course it's gonna have resonance to me. But for the young drinking community and the people as they come of age and, and, and decide to get involved with beer, they have different desires and, and it's gonna be really difficult for the, the macro world to sort of take that out. So as long as we all love creativity and craft beer and sort of that sense of independence, um, it's going to go a long way. And I really hope that craft beer continues to market itself that way because, um, you know, uh, Sam Adams isn't even the largest U.S. owned brewery because it's publicly traded. So we don't really know even what percentage of that ownership is, or at least I don't. I'm sure they do. But um, 
we're the last U.S. owned breweries, you know, and uh, uh, the more that we get behind that and, and think in that term, the more that it's a success for everybody. Great. So we have time for uh, three audience questions. So um, if three people want to come to the microphone uh, right here, if you don't mind, and ask a question. Hi. Um, it's been really interesting to hear you talk about your brewery. I was wondering um, how many uh, different um, kinds of beer are you brewing at any given point in time, and is it a continuous process? So you're constantly canning, brewing and canning and brewing and canning, or do you take breaks in between? Uh, so we brew 24 hours a day when we're brewing within a given week, but it's not seven days a week. It just depends on the brew schedule for that week. and. Um, typically between probably seven and 12 different beers going at a time. And then throughout the year, between maybe 20 and 25 total beers, depending on special projects and single batch beers and things like that. So we have a uh, variety of different things going on at any given point. Yeast management, different strains, all of that stuff plays into it. So um, we have a pretty flexible team and a pretty flexible brewery setup, so it allows us to be creative and, and do a lot of things uh, throughout the year. Yeah, and, and when we have two, two brew houses, so um, neither one of the brew houses is functioning all week long, so we split the, split the batchings uh, between it to uh, keep for efficiency's sake, although we were playing a little bit with some of that, but in, in general we do have two brew houses, so in addition to it, 24 hours for a limited you know, time period, it's also separated between two brew houses across the street from each other. Okay, so you spent, uh, the <laughs> you said the yeast to space, which is really cool. Um, I mean, we all, like, I, I think we'd all love to do such a similar thing, but uh, is there anything different about the yeast? Did it like mutate from all the extra radiation in space? Or can, is there anything, I mean, you make a lot of beer, so do you taste anything different about this yeast than the yeast before it went up, or is it just like, it's fun because it went to space? Well, I mean, to, to be clear, the goal of the project was to send the yeast up and have it back the same. As scientists, as what we do when we propagate yeast, we're not trying to create mutants, we're not trying to turn people into lizard alien folk when they drink their beer. Uh, I mean, it'd be fun, you know, that'd be cool. Um, uh, but. Uh, what we did do when we got the yeast up and back is that we made a batch of IPA, you know, the beer that we make that makes up 50 to 55 percent of what we make in, in a given period of time. But uh, um, we took a batch of that and we diverted some of the work that we made into a separate, uh, you know, basically 10 gallon homebrew batch size. And we had cropped up the yeast and made beer with the same work with, you know, yeast in space, yeast, you know, that we had so that we could check on it and it was the same, you know, as far as that goes. I will say though, it, you know, um, that second ride was a cold one for it, and you know, um, the, the yeast was actually cryogenic in a way. It froze while it was up in space, um, and it worked. But uh, it did, it, you know, it was a big trip, and it took a little culturing up. So, to that degree, the the the, the beers, the yeast tastes the same, but it took a lot of work to get it back when it came back. How high did it go, and how long was it up there? That's a good question. It, it, well, wasn't, it was suborbital, right? Uh, 77 miles, yeah, suborbital. So okay. 77 miles in about four minutes outside of the... Yeah, it's a 15-minute rocket cycle, basically, where it launch, uh, launches up, spends about four minutes in space, and then it, it takes you know a good 10 minutes to get back between the, the different levels of, uh, of, of return, so it slows down and doesn't hit at maximum you know, impact. Thanks. Great. Last audience question. All right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Two quick questions. Uh, so, one, what do you make of the trend in hard ciders? And two, uh, are you doing anything? Are you doing anything about the drought, or has the drought affected you? Uh, hard ciders are great. It seems to be growing, um, and I think there's a lot of cider drinkers. I'm excited. We have a couple new cideries in our area that are focusing on more traditional uh, European style of cider, which is a little drier. Um, which I'm not a big sweet cider fan, so I think that's going to continue. I think it's a great sort of new creative avenue for a lot of people. Um, and then, uh, second question? Uh, the about the drought. Oh, the drought. So Oregon, <laughs> Oregon has uh, less snowpack than uh, a lot of years, but where we live in Eugene, we're fortunate to have access to a consistent and one of the best, actually, water sources in the country via the Cascade Range and the McKenzie River. And so Oregon's 
topography is, and geology are different than California, so even if we don't get snow, um, our ground is a lot more porous, so we get a lot more water collection versus the granite you guys have here, which if you don't get snow, then it just runs directly out to the ocean. So um, where we're at in Oregon, we're really fortunate to have uh, access to a consistent and uh, future supply of water. But it is going to be a challenge for the industry in a lot of places, and so definitely a topical uh, question in the conversation that's going on. Yeah, to, uh, to follow up with that, I used to make cider at Steelhead, and uh, we actually have a winery license, um, and uh, we'll make a little bit of cider on site uh, to, 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 to honor that and to be able to um, sell a little bit of cider at our tasting room. It's sort of a gluten-free option. We work with some of the local cideries uh, already to have cider for people who visit that are in that state. But uh, I, I will say with the cider boom, um, new apple trees take five years to produce fr fruit. So uh, with, the, with the huge run of what's going on in cider, your access to apples is very limited. So I'm currently working with a farmer who is local in Eugene, um, who has a press and is looking for a, a place to sell his apples in a very direct way, which is what I used to have uh, back in the steelhead days with a farm that is um, whose uh, owner uh, uh, you know, sold the farm basically. But we've now found a new source uh, to be able to do a little of that, but I, I don't really, well, every input good into a brewery is a commodity, and um, you know, getting into the apple trade is, would be a pretty hard thing right now. Um, and then, um, um, the drought. The drought, but uh, well, we're, we're making a lot more beer for you guys in preparation, I think is a good way <laughs> to put it. So, um, but um, you know, we're very concerned for that. You know, I, I, Nikos and I are not interested in, in, in building breweries on the East Coast or the Midwest, and we've seen some of our older friends step up and, and, and do those sorts of things. And I will say, I gotta give them a little credit for, I wouldn't have thought about a big drought and being told that you had to produce 25% than last year you know they can put that into capacity in their new facilities that have had you know in some cases really giant snow years so um i don't know if that was part of their you know plan but good on them because they're going to be less affected than some of the other breweries that are local great so we have a few trivia questions uh if you win trivia you get a poster uh from john so let's see who is paying attention you don't have to go to the mic you and can just can shout I, it out can i just talk about that real quick about oh, the poster yeah. uh neil williams is a what we call a gig art uh, a gig artist in which he does concert posters. He's worked with Dave Matthews and um, boy, uh, Interpol, Trombone Shorty, Galactic, all kinds of bands. Uh, and he recently moved to Eugene and, and worked on the project for us for all the artwork that's here. So these are all hand screen printed by the artist. Um, and they also glow in the dark because we're rad like that. And uh, anyway, um, just wanted to give a little plug to the artwork because that's another fun and giant piece of this whole project was putting it all together that way. Oh, there it is, Van of White. Oh yes. So feel free to shout it out. You don't have to go to microphone this time. Uh, what does Ninkazi mean? Yes. Yes. All right. Nice. Perfect. All right. Um, at what altitude <laughs> did the rocket go to? How high did it go? Yes. Correct. All right. Uh, what are this? I guess we didn't talk about this, but what are the four ingredients of beer? There we go. Nailed it. Nailed what, it if you just stand up and come down to grab it. Oh, yeah. It's over here. What, uh, what style of beer is ground control? Right there. Good moderation here. Right. What were the, th uh, so this, you just yell out one. Uh, what was one of the three hot varieties in ground control? Yep. Three? Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you yelled one of those out, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I lost you guys. Um, how many employees does, does Nankazi Brewery currently have? We didn't talk about this, but if you're within five to ten, uh, you get... Yes. Wow. It's 106, it. so you're right on there. Um, Actually, 107. You're hard. No, I'm just kidding. And then... Um, Last, last question, two-part question. What are the two byproducts of fermentation? We did not talk about that either. CO2 and alcohol. CO2 and alcohol. Someone said space, which is awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, that's it. If everybody could give a round of applause to our... Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for coming out. And uh, I believe everyone gets to try ground control on the way out. So as you're walking out, um, feel free to give a taste of ground control. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you yeah. for having us.
Até que lá.